Hey everyone, Tim Morgan here, and I am back with another Vision Jet video for you in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Now, as I've said in previous videos, I fly the SF-50 Vision Jet in real life, and I just got back from my annual recurrent training in the full motion simulator. This was a good recurrent because I was paired with an instructor who has spent a lot of time thinking about Cap's philosophy, when to pull, when not to pull, and so on. I learned a lot. I figured that since we have Cap's now in FS 2024, I'd share what I learned with you, and we can go over when and how CAPS is used in the Vision Jet. If you just want to skip to the part where I actually show how CAPS is used, go ahead and use the chapter markers to skip ahead. But first, I'm going to start with a little theory and background. CAPS, of course, stands for Cirrus Airframe Parachute System, and it's a Ballistic Recovery System, or BRS. It's the defining part of every Cirrus aircraft ever built going back to the very first SR. The Vision Jet is no exception and it became the first personal jet with a BRS installed. There's a large parachute in the nose cone of the aircraft and of course that tantalizing red handle on the overhead emergency console. When you pull that handle, a number of things happen, some of which you may already know and some of which you may not expect. Firstly, in real life, when you pull that handle, the CAPS autopilot activates. You see, the parachute is only tested up to 135 knots indicated or 145 knots true, so the jet will attempt to fly itself into those parameters by leveling the wings and pitching the nose up. Once it's within the release parameters, the parachute is deployed. The autopilot will also deploy the parachute no matter what if 32 seconds elapse or if 8 seconds elapse with no detected deceleration. The parachute deployment is a multi-stage process. A CAPS control box sends a signal to the electronic sequencer which activates the rocket igniter. As the rocket climbs out of the CAPS bay, it triggers a pickup collar that causes three ejector bags to inflate. The inflators then push the parachute assembly out of the caps bay behind the rocket. The rocket then extracts the parachute harnesses from the stow bag. As the rocket continues to climb, it pays out the entire parachute assembly in the proper order for deployment. A reefing slider controls the inflation of the main parachute. Finally, the rear harness is snubbed to return the aircraft to a nose down attitude for landing. This is all quite complex, and only some of this is simulated in FS2024. I really just wanted an excuse to show you the cool 3D graphics that Cirrus rendered as part of its type training program. The CAPS parachute is only effective above 600 feet AGL. Between 600 feet and 2000 feet AGL, immediate rehearsed action is required. Because of this, we SF-50 pilots are taught a very specific emergency takeoff briefing. It goes like this. From brake release to 60 knots, I will abandon the takeoff for any cast message or malfunction. From 60 knots to rotation speed, I will abandon the takeoff for any critical failure or cast warning. From rotation to 600 feet AGL for an engine failure, I will land straight ahead. For a fire, I will continue, then return to the airport and land. From 600 feet AGL to 2000 feet AGL for an engine failure, I will pull caps immediately. For a fire, I will return to the airport and land. Above 2000 feet AGL, I will perform the appropriate memory items and checklists. As you can see, it's that 600 to 2000 feet altitude band that's critical. Any hesitation in that zone will result in a late caps pull and potentially a fatal impact. Also, we're not gonna be discussing engine fires in this video, but I did include them because they're a part of the critical takeoff emergency briefing. Now, so far, everything I've told you is stuff that should be familiar to any Cirrus pilot, SR or SF. We're all taught about the CAPS critical altitude band and the importance of an automatic rehearsed CAPS pull if something happens in that zone. That's not new. What might be new to a lot of Cirrus pilots is my instructor's thoughts on what I like to call the death zone. The death zone is the region above which you can no longer land with runway remaining and below CAPS altitude. If you have an engine failure in that zone, you're landing on whatever's beyond the runway. If, like me, you fly out of a metropolitan airport, you're gonna be crashing into trees or worse, houses. The shorter the runway, the wider your death zone. The goal then is to minimize the time you spend in the death zone. There's two ways you can do this. The first, obviously, is to climb more quickly through it. My instructor recommended maintaining a speed of around 120 knots until you get to cap's altitude. The second way is to zoom climb the aircraft if you do get an engine failure in the death zone. You may get an engine failure at, say, 400 to 500 feet, which is technically below the cap's envelope, but you can pop the nose up and float the aircraft above cap's altitude, which will result in a much better outcome than and accepting a landing on whatever's in front of you. In the real sim, we practiced pulling the nose up to just below the stall fence anytime we had an engine failure below cap's altitude. This is what the stall fence looks like. It tells you how much more pitch authority you have before you reach the critical angle of attack and stall. 
So putting this all together, I now have some new takeoff procedures, which are different than the takeoff procedures I discussed in previous videos. Here are the new procedures. Rotate at 90 knots and pitch the nose up for 120 knots, ignoring the flight director. Bring the gear up with positive rate of climb. Bring the flaps up at 115 knots. At 600 feet, call caps available, touch the caps handle, and then activate the autopilot. The autopilot will begin pitching for 165 knots and will reduce thrust to MCT. In FS 2024, you also have to activate the lateral and vertical modes you want. In the real jet, you can arm up all that stuff on the ground before takeoff. I also have some new emergency procedures. These procedures must be rehearsed until they're instinctive and automatic. If I have an engine failure below cap's altitude, I will immediately pop the nose up to the stall fence. If I can get the aircraft above 600 feet AGL, I'll pull caps. Otherwise, I'll perform the engine failure after takeoff memory items. Nose down, gear down, flaps down, land. If I have an engine failure above cap's altitude, obviously, I'll pull caps. Okay, let's try this out in Microsoft Flight Simulator with a couple of different scenarios. First, we'll start with a normal takeoff, no emergencies, just to show you the new procedures in practice. My callouts will be 60 knots, above which I'll only abort for a major emergency, 90 rotate, and caps available. I will pitch to 120 knots after rotation, and I'll hold it until I'm in the caps envelope. You'll also notice that I set the minimums bug to the caps critical altitude. This is a procedure I do in real life as well. Take off to the T, engine instruments, airspeed alive, 60. Ninety rotate. Positive rate, gear up. One fifteen flaps up. Caps available. Now, let's demonstrate an engine failure within the caps envelope below 2,000 feet AGL. The callouts will be the same. The only difference will be that I will perform an immediate, rehearsed, and reflexive caps pull the moment that I sense an engine failure. Take off. To the T, engine instruments, airspeed alive. 60. Ninety rotate. Positive rate, gear up. One fifteen flaps up. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Now I'll demonstrate a low altitude engine failure after takeoff with runway remaining. This is a departure from a long runway, and so our death zone is pretty small. As a review, the memory items for this emergency are nose down, gear down, flaps down. Takeoff. To the T, engine instruments, airspeed alive. 60. Ninety rotate. Positive rate, gear up. Nose down, gear down, flaps down. Don't sink. Don't sink. By the way, the real jet does not glide nearly this well when dirty. It would have touched down by now. Remember that this is a long runway. If you have an engine failure in the death zone on a shorter Shink runway, rate. you may be forced Shink to turn rate. towards the flattest thing Shink you can rate. see in front of you. Shink rate. Don't shink. 
don't. Finally, let's demonstrate the new procedure, the engine failure just below cap's altitude. The new procedure will be to pop the nose up to the stall and try to apex within the cap's critical band. The instant that the aircraft climbs above the cap's altitude, I will reflexively pull the handle. If I can't get the aircraft into the cap's envelope, then it's time for those memory items again. Nose down, gear down, flaps down. Take off. To the T, engine instruments, airspeed alive. Sixty. Ninety rotate. Positive rate, gear up. One fifteen flaps up. As a side note, once again, the FS twenty twenty four Vision Jet significantly outperforms the real thing. We would have hit the stall fence by now, and we would not be apexing nearly this high. Shink rate. Shink rate. Pull up. Pull up. All right, that's it for our scenarios. As you can see, CAPS is not an idiot-proof system like people think. It requires training and rehearsal in order to get it right, just like any other aircraft emergency system. One of the most important parts of sim training is just drilling those CAPS scenarios over and over until you're doing it quickly and without hesitation in all the right scenarios, and you're not pulling CAPS in the scenarios where you shouldn't. It's tough stuff, and it requires training and practice to get it right. Unfortunately, the one thing that all the sim training in the world can't simulate is the hesitation you feel when it's your real-life multi-million dollar aircraft that you're about to destroy on purpose. I'm lucky enough that I haven't had to experience that yet, and I can only hope that if I do, I won't hesitate to do the right thing and pull that handle if I need to. Thanks for watching. If a Sobo or working title adds more support for other emergencies, such as engine fire or depressurization, I will be sure to do full pro-level tutorials on those as well. Safe flying.